terms of what you guys would probably see at this point in time. Um, my journey to get to this point in time, happy with that, um, uh, brings us here through uh, sitting in a TAFE course in 1994 down at Rye, where I studied the subject or had a subject as part of the business department, which was total quality management. Um, so those of you that have been in the industry a long time, you'll know that 1994 was, was, was the year, essentially, that 9001 um, was published after years of discussion and debate around different systems and processes to come to an international standard. So at that point in time, we start talking about what's this international standard, really international standards hadn't been discussed. Um, I didn't really pay much attention at that point in time to what was going on, except that my dad said um, he had a professional architectural practice um, in, um, uh, and they were tendering on some work for a local council. Um, he's got some pretty amazing buildings that he's built over the years. And he said, oh, can you write me a quality manual? Because I had that was just done one for an assignment for the subject. I'm like, sure, so I wrote 18 procedures, didn't even um, wrote 18 quality procedures as a 19-year-old um, at the time, um, and he got certified. So by QAS at the time. So um, so I must know something. I've been doing it a few years. Um, fast forward a couple more years. All of a sudden, I'm sitting in a uni degree out at the University of Western Sydney, talking about environmental management systems in 1996. And those of you that've been in the industry for a while, you'll know that 1996 was ISO 14000. That was the year that was, uh, again, after much debate about EMAS and the different environmental management systems. So I'm sitting in this uh, lecture hall, thongs. I had a blue cattle dog at the time, six month old puppy sitting under my chair. I was at you know, Wattles Hawkesbury Agricultural College. Um, we're having a discussion about what environmental management systems could do to save the planet. That's really where my, my passion is. I have a Bachelor of Applied Science in Environmental Management. Um, after leaving university, I went to do um, uh, in, in um, somewhere around about 1998, um, and you're gonna have a giggle now, uh, greenhouse auditing and establishing carbon footprints um, under the Cities for Climate Protection campaign. So I went and worked my way around 20 councils Australia-wide doing their greenhouse modeling and working out the carbon footprint um, in, in 98, 99, and the earlier part of 2000. Uh, so at the time, um, I was being called by the council as an environmental auditor, or greenhouse auditor, um, and um, I ended up at Hornsby Council just north of sitting there. And we did 1,500 environmental reviews of business off the back of what we started with the Cities for Climate Protection campaign. We went right down into the Solutions to Pollution project. Um, and it was a really interesting time in my career because I was seeing the really, really um, hardcore, dirty part of environmental protection. Um, I was authorised, I was an authorised officer under the Protection Environment Operations Act and just banging out fines every day under Section 120 for water pollution. I was driving around Hornsby and, and their the greater Hornsby area with a ticket book in a Commodore, finding people for throwing cigarette butts out the window of their car, $200. <laughs> Write their rego down, take a photo of the car, go to the police station, get the details, $200 fines. And that was our sort of water pollution campaign. Um, and we trained a whole bunch of elite auditors to be able to do that work, to, to do that work. Um, for those of you that know my history from that point in time, I worked at SAO Global for, for, for about 12 months um, and left there completely burnt out as you, you could probably share. Um, the, the challenges of SAO Global continue to be the same um, all this time later. Um, and, um, and my passion really is teaching people. My passion is teaching people to, to really think through um, you know, what it is they're doing, why they're doing it, and really challenge improvement. And that comes off the back of an observation uh, through 94, 95 uh, of my dad's business, because I'd helped him a little bit and I was you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, I'd watched my dad uh, grow a business basically my whole life. Architectural practice and a commercial construction company. In 1994, um, we, we came to a point in time in the life of that business where we lost everything. Uh, the construction industry had crashed in the uh, in the beginning of the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, we had spent the whole time as a family, really tight knit family. We've got a brother and a sister, mum and dad. You know the, 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 the typical Australian family. Dad had grown a business. You know he had a nice, few nice cars. We had a boat. We had a waterfront house. Um, we had worked very hard as a family to build our family home and off the back of my dad's business. In 1994, the National Australia Bank repossessed our house, the house that we had built ourselves. I was 18 years old at the time. From the age of 18 to the age of 20, my dad didn't say a single word for two years. So we've just had, are you okay day? He wasn't okay. So for me, I've really questioned, um, you know, I watched the impact, I felt the impact of what a business has on a family, the highs and the lows, the international holidays, the, you know, the great holidays of you know, beachside places, the fall driving on Stockton Beach, or the, you know, all that crazy stuff that, 
that you do, but then I also saw the lows. Um, and, and the lows was something that I was really concerned with because not only did it affect our family, but it affected 50 other families. And so I've had this passion for business and I've really, probably from my own concern, but I don't want to put my young family through the same thing. So while I stand here as the CEO of a certification body and we're quite an aggressive competitor in the marketplace, um, I'm really just passionate about helping people with business. So I wanted to bring a lens to the presentation for you guys today to really challenge three basic definitions that I think we all forget. And I'm gonna go through those. We can talk about the nuances of the clauses of the standard. We can talk about the changes of the standard. But the observation that I've made, and I'm gonna hold my team responsible for, is that if I say to my team in their performance reviews that we do anywhere from three months informally to you know six monthly, a little bit more formally, annually, very formally, when I say to my team, what, more, what training do you guys want? What development do you want? They want, we want more technical training. My observation has been, and Mike and I were just having a chat about this, it's been my observation that the fundamental error that we have made as industry professionals is we have gone too technical and we have neglected our soft skills. We've neglected our leadership skills. We've neglected our, the simple skill that we should have as humans as the skill of deploying empathy. And that is something that I really want to challenge you guys. If you take anything away from this presentation today, do me a favor this afternoon, go and Google empathy. But Google the defi definition of empathy and really have to think about that. And I've got a slide that we'll, we'll come to in a second which is really going to challenge, challenge that. So let's have, just have a quick look at a couple of definitions. The first one is what is a business? And I think the one thing that we forget is the thing that brings us all together today is money. And we all go out every day to earn money. Does anybody do this as a hobby for free? No. So I think we've got to be mindful of the fact that money brings us all together. Whether we're a not-for-profit, whether we're a government agency, whether we're a certification body, whether we're an organisation, we forget that. And when we start talking about money and how important money is, because that's the grease. That's the grease on the cogs that makes our management systems, our policies, procedures, training, everything that we're doing in organisations. That's, that's the thing that oils it and, 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 and makes it function and work and reduces friction. And when we look at the definition of business, I think it's important to take time out sometimes, just go back to the dictionary, because we can learn so much, and we can say, well, a business is defined as, defined as an organization or enterprising entity, enterprising entity, I'll come back to, uh, engaged in commercial, industrial, professional activities. Businesses can be for, uh, for profit, they can be not for profit, um, they operate to fulfill a charitable mission or further a social cause. The term business also refers to the organized efforts and activities of individuals to produce and sell goods and services profit, and businesses range in scale, obviously, as we know, from sole people to, to large multinationals. It's, it, it is enter, it's all enterprising, and the first thing that we can fall into a blockage of, oh no, I work for not-for-profit, you know, but then we talk about the enterprise of not-for-profit. I work for a government department, I work for RMS Services New South Wales. The head of audit and risk is one of my best friends from Service New South Wales. And so we have this, in fact, tomorrow morning we're having coffee for two hours and we're talking about the enterprising activities of Service New South Wales and, and how the systems and processes work. But the conversation tomorrow is all about the soft skills of our people, about how to deploy empathy across the organisation, because we are, at the end of the day, it's all about money, it's all about people, and organisations are all adults. Because we're not, despite the joke, right, that, that there may be some children in some of our organisations and that might be like operating in kindergarten sometimes, we forget some of those really basic things. We're talking about adults, and we're talking about adult education, we're talking about inspiring and motivating adults, and we're actually bringing all those adults together to give them money. So maybe Mike, maybe I'm gonna buy a service from Mike and Mike is gonna give me some money. It's not my money, it's Alexi's money, because I'm gonna take Mike's money it's not actually mine to mine, I'm gonna give it to Alexi. And then Alexi, you might buy a service from you guys or a service from someone who's gonna to sell to you guys. And so we've really gotta think about how that liquid, the cash flow, works and keep that top of mind. And that gives us a segue into the rest of what we're gonna do because we can get down into the nuts and bolts of, okay, how do we make that work efficiently? How do we make that work effectively? How do we address requirements, legal requirements, other Organisational behaviour, another definition, I think is it's time for us to have a look at some of these definitions and keep them top of mind. And, and, and this is me really challenging the industry to move away from a discussion about clause 8.2.2.18. Does that make sense? And it's got a colon or a semicolon. Mm -hmm. There is a joke 
that a committee set out to design a racehorse and they ended up with a camel. The standards, the ISO standards are camels. They're not racehorses. And so I really want to encourage you as much as possible. And this is me as a certifier, you know, I sit on top of 1,200 companies who have a retainer. Some of them are Jazz Hands accredited certification, some of the other certification programs, all that sort of stuff. The amount of time and energy that I see you wasted debating full stops, keywords, the number of shells, the how many policies and procedures, and more importantly, back to my life story, the amount of anxiety that I see created in organisations in prepping for audits, you know, in, in worrying about what we need to do from a compliance perspective, we forget the fact that this is all about organisational behaviour. It's about the adults, it's about the people, it's about the families, it's about the children. How about we remove some of the anxiety that's existing in the industry so that the kids in that family are happier because their mum or their dad got home a little bit earlier because they're not prepping till midnight to an audit. I'm not stupid, I'm not a stupid person. I see in the date modified, midnight, 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 <laughs> midnight, the day before I turn up to do an audit, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not what this is intended to do. Aren't we here to debate how we can help organisations to grow and improve? That's what we're here for, right? Like we're all professionals that are genuinely passionate. You know, there's some competitors in the room, there's all that sort of stuff, right? But at the end of the day, we're genuinely there to help organisations grow and improve, right? So when we go back and look at these definitions, definitions particularly something like organisational behaviour, we can say it's the academic study of ways people act within groups. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about organisations, their groups. They could be like teams, they could be, you know, we can talk in certification bodies, we talk scope. What's the scope? That's the group that we're referring to and the activities of a group. And so we want to start to look at that. Its principles are applied prim primarily in the attempts to make businesses operate more effectively. So we have ISO 9001. It's designed to help a group operate more effectively. We talk about objectives and targets and monitoring and measurement of outcomes. The, the study of organisational behaviour includes areas of research dedicated to improving job performance, increasing job satisfaction, promoting innovation, encouraging, encouraging leadership. Each has its own recommended actions, such as organising groups, modifying compensation structures, changing methods of performance evaluation. So this is a completely random definition. It's in Investopedia, if you want to go Google. It's not from Wikipedia, it's not from a particular thing, but it's in Investopedia. And so back over in the money side of definitions of the internet, if you like, we're seeing common threads through here that we see through the definitions in ISO 9001. Now, you guys, I assume everyone's read this thing, but we don't need to sit here and I don't need to give an intro session on ISO 9001, I want to, want to talk to you about, you know, at, at its core, a policy, a procedure, you know, they're all guidance notes, they're all forms of written, repeatable communication. We want to leave a message for somebody, we want to go up and do something else, we want to leave a message, let's leave a policy. We want to, you know, we want to go do something, we want to leave a message, let's write a procedure or work instruction. Hey, I want you to be able to do stuff, I'm just going to walk away and I'm going to go and do the things that I need to do because I'm really, really busy, here's the work instruction. Like, just read that stuff, you'll be right. You know? If you want to get high performance cooks that have got no skills, what do you do? You sit them down in front of Jamie Oliver. Right? Really simple methodology, really simple set of ingredients. It's not all perfect and amazing. Couple it up with a TV show. You've got a great way to get a huge force of unskilled labour to deliver almost a consistent outcome. Does that make sense? So I don't know if any of you guys have watched um, any of our YouTube stuff, any of our social media stuff, um, some of you might have unbothered us because we are too noisy. Um, in the 1.5 million unit views that I've had on my YouTube channel now, the most common complaint or comment I get is over here in encouraging leadership. The biggest struggle, and you tell me if this is right or wrong, the biggest struggle that the vast majority of people have to watch our stuff is I can't encourage leadership. I can't get leadership buy-in. I can't get leadership to participate. So if so, I can sit and say, okay, well, we can. I can give my team more technical training. I can say, yes, thank you very much for sitting down and let's go into the performance review. You know, let's talk about your development plan. Well, I want more technical skills. That's what you want, but the marketplace is telling us that leadership are not bought in. Last night I was at a board meeting of the Royal Mighty Yacht Club in Newport in, uh, down in Sydney, which is just, if you don't know where Newport is, just below Palm Beach there on the Northern Beaches. And I was sitting next to a very old friend of mine who is the chairman of the PwC board. Um, he also happens to sit on the board of Sydney Water and we're having a discussion. And he was like, 
we're done with this stuff. Like we're done with ISO 9001. So when you have the chairman of the PwC board who says, this doesn't add any value to our business, we're not gonna do it, and he goes over to Sydney Water, and Sydney Water maintain it from a certification perspective, it gets tendered, all that sort of stuff. He is sitting in a group of 13, 14, 15 directors, and he doesn't agree that that adds any value. And Mike and I were discussing the contents pages of systems and process patterns. You know, it's following the causes of the standards, it's not process patterns. You know, the number one change that has happened for ISO 9001, which is, I think is the most important, is we start talking about risk-based thinking. You know, we start talking about building a management system. So we can, you know, we can go to one more definition and we can say, well, what, all right, then what is a management system? It's a set of policies, processes, procedures used by an organization to ensure that it can fulfill the tasks required to achieve its objectives. Big show of hands, who's got an iPhone? All right, who doesn't have an iPhone, big show of hands? Okay, so it's not quite 50-50, but it's close. Just that one example is two different solutions to a problem. We're sitting in a room of people who think, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, because I'm, I'm all in, I'm 9001, don't worry about that. But is it the solution? Is 9001 the solution to a problem? So then we can ask the question, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And I think we've spent as an industry too much time not thinking about what's the problem we're trying to solve, and we're frustrated. Mike and I'll talk, sorry, Mike to keep throwing you in this, but we're talking about internal audits. You know, we're just talking about things like, you know, we're having this conversation about, you know, organizations not doing their internal audits of their own management system. Okay, well, why would you do that? Why don't we ask that question? Why don't we start to say, well, why would someone get ISO 9001 certified? Let's, let's like go all the way back and say, from a certifier's perspective, the most common phone call that we get to our office at 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon is we've got a tender due on Tuesday morning and we need to be certified when it's time. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Every Friday, without a doubt, for the last 20 years of my career, the last 15 years running best practice, people walk, I, get the, I watch the phone, it's like 3.59, 3.59.30 seconds, four o'clock, there it goes, it rings, and she picks up the phone in the Sydney office and off we go, we're having a conversation. You know, um, and so, you know, the last, the one most recently has been our neighbor, who's the level below us in our office, is like, yeah, we need to be certified in the next month for the Department of Education. But, I, but we've got to go back to that question. We've got to say, well, well, why? So a management system is a solution. What's the problem? And this is a question for you guys. What is the problem that this solves? The feasibility. The problem of being able to consistently deliver the level of quality that the business yeah. requires to achieve its objectives. Repeatability. Repeatability. That's exactly right. So let's go and talk about Jamie Oliver for a second. Everyone knows who he is, right? I'm not talking about, yeah, everyone, you know, the making chef. So, so my wife hates cooking, hates it. I'm the cook, I'm the guy that went to TAFE and did a cooking course and, you know, when I get the time, I'm the guy that does the cooking, you know. We've got a big weekend of family and friends and everything this weekend. Our house is, I left early this morning just to get out of the house and come, that's why I volunteer, by the way. Um, get out of the house of, um, of, of people. But, you know, Fiona, um, she gets really anxious about cooking. I'm like, well, hey, Okay, let's have a think about this. We've got all these amazing Apple devices. Let's get something set up on the kitchen bench. Let's, would it, how would it be if someone showed you how to do it? That'd be amazing. Okay, bang, open YouTube. Let's find Jamie Oliver. Okay, then let's try and match your recipe with the, with the amazing cookbooks that she's great at buying cookbooks. So off she goes to my room, she buys the latest Jamie Oliver cookbook. It's sitting in the cupboard. I rip it out. I'm like, right, let me do the Google search because that's what I'm famous for. Okay, we'll go find the Google search. We'll, do the, we'll find the video, the episode that goes with the recipe in the book. So then we almost get repeatability. Now, people have eaten my wife's cooking and gone on to live perfectly normal lives. And so we really want to, I really want you guys to really be challenging how can we think about making this really simple? How can we reduce anxiety? How can we re think really strategically about what a policy or a procedure or a process looks like? You know, and, and let me just use jazz ends as an example. I heard them mentioned earlier in the room. I had jazz ends last week. Um, and, and so our quarterly, we do a quarterly business review and a quarterly business strategy session every 12 weeks. Sometimes they run late. But we do essentially four management reviews a year. We, I try really hard to walk through all. I, I hate getting the phone calls where you're a quality organization, how's your quality system going? I hate those phone calls. Because I take them really personally. Like I'm out there making a lot of noise on social media, video, webinars, you know, all the stuff on YouTube. 
and I want to make sure. I've been criticised for not walking the talk, but when you really dig deep into us, yes, of course I missed the date by two weeks, but we still have a real deal. So we grab all this stuff, all this technology, we just record video all day, every day. You know, right now I've got um, something going straight live to our YouTube channel, which is me, it's not you guys. No one knows you're here, but that's straight out to our YouTube channel, so we've captured it. I've got a camera here recording everything we do. So we turn the cameras on and we record our management review. Jazz hands, and I think it's done. Press save, stick it in the Google Drive, everyone's asleep, that's the management review. We've got four of them, there they are. Jazz hands walks in. Can you please show me your management review meeting minutes? Where's it saying the standard? I have to do that. Mm -hmm. So for those of you are of you in the room who are being audited, I want to give you the trick of the trade. Show me where it says I have to do that. That's the most important question you can, as an auditee, you can be asking in an audit. Show me where it says I have to do that. Because, back to my comment about, you know, our lack of soft skills, our, we're drilling down too technical. Even my guys, my guys will get really complicated, then they'll form their opinion. I haven't seen them for a couple of weeks. I haven't been able to calibrate them, and they're a little bit off on a tangent. We've all seen those auditors that get on their high horse, and, and I was the guy, I wouldn't stop talking. They'll form their opinion, and, and it's not kept in check. And it, it is up to you guys, this, you know, this is about my thing from a certifier's perspective, I want you guys to be learning in those processes and asking that question, show me where it says I need to do that. So anyway, back to Jazz Hands. I say, well, show me where it says I have to have a set of meeting minutes. It doesn't say that. It just says you need to do these management reviews. I'm like, see that Google Drive? See those three files that are labeled strategic planning and review? That's our management review. They're like, I'm not gonna sit here and watch an AI video. I'm like, well, you want to see the minutes? You want to see what was said, who said it, when they said it, how they said it, the tone they used, what they agreed to, what actions they committed to, what was discussed, what was agreed, at exactly what time in the day, the transcript with the face that's talking, the real minutes, the real evidence that you're presenting court from the security camera. No, no, I need you to write me up a set of minutes. So you want me to take a month later, a video, watch it, interpret it, so it's in my eyes, out my, you know, out my mouth, out my fingers on the keyboard, and write some sort of summary representation. Not a true reflection of what went, what took place. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. So I really want you to start to challenge policies and procedures, Jamie Oliver's cooking videos. And, and so from our perspective, what 9001, and particularly the recent change, it's given me a bigger soapbox to go back to that time when my dad's business failed, why did it fail? To go back to a time that I wrote 18 procedures in a quality manual that made absolutely no difference to my dad's business and we still lost the family base. And go back to a time in the kitchen where bringing up a YouTube video and a Jamie Oliver cookbook and my wife feels less anxious about cooking dinner for the thousands of people that are in our house this weekend. Because that's what's happening in your organisations on a day-by-day -day basis. And if you, you could unlock your phone for me quickly. I, just by chance, I was walking, I was, had a bit of a headache earlier this week and I'm walking around my office and I picked up a really old textbook from the early 90s called Organisational Behaviour. It came with a Six Sigma training course that I did. And I wrote down on a bit of butcher's paper and stuck it on the wall in my office and I asked someone to just text this picture up. It was around motivators and hygiene factors. Who's heard that before? Like human motivators and hygiene factors. And so what it talked about is the people that we are building these management systems for. We've got it, this is about deploying empathy, right? This is the technical, let's get down to the clauses version of how we deploy empathy. In organizational behavior, if we look at motive, human motivators, you all, we all have the desire to feel achievement. We all have the, the, the desire to get recognition for our accomplishments. And that, you know, as a certification organisation, that is one thing we definitely do. We send out the $25,000 piece of paper that's got the varnish stamp on it that says certified. You know, but that is the recommend, uh, recognition for achievement. We all want, you all want, we all want to do challenging work. We all want to feel a level of increased responsibility. And we all want growth and development. Nothing's changed in the human race. When we talk about hygiene factors, we need things like policies and administration processes to follow. We need supervision and guidance like the master and the apprentice scheme. Um, we need 
flexible working arrangement so that we haven't got life putting stress on us when we're at work. Like, we, oh shit, I've got to get the washing off the line, I've got to pick up the kids from school, all of that crazy stuff that goes on. These are the real life people that you sit next to in organisations every day. And we want to have interpersonal relations and we want to have money, status and security. And some of you might say, hey, that sounds like Maslow. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what I want you guys to be really thinking about, and I'll get into in a, in a session, in a second, I'll get into this space thinking and we talk about the specific changes of this town and we can open up for discussion. I want you to think about those people that you seek to serve on a day-to-day -day basis. Because then our guys, our technical guys, your technical guys, you know, we will take the time to be the interpreters. Don't, don't build a system that is predicated on clauses of the standard just because you want to make the auditor's life easy. Make the auditor's life really difficult. Make them have challenging work. Feel a sense of recognition. Does that make sense? Build something that works for the, for the part-time mom that's just the admin person that's trying to hustle and get the kids to school, she's going through divorce, she's doing all the crazy stuff, to just get there and feel empowered and do challenging work herself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And build a management system that does that. So really, that's what this next slide was really about. It's like, why are we doing I want you to challenge that. I want you to look at audit yourself on a day-to-day -day basis and go, you know, we're seeing tons of stuff on Instagram, social media, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, all that sort of stuff about, you know, get up at four o'clock in the morning and do exercise and meditate and eat properly and all that crazy stuff that's going on in terms of motivating people, but really just ask ourselves the question, why? The other question is, can we buy time? How can we get more time? Like, you know, the most successful people on the planet, they've got the same 24 hours as us, they've got the same skin, heart, ears, eyes, brain, all that sort of stuff. But what a lot of those people do, and I read tons and tons and tons of books, what a lot of those people do is they just constantly audit what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and they stop doing dumb shit. And really, a management system in its infancy, it's really, a, it, and, I, and I started saying this about 10 years ago, it is what we certify is that you have built yourself a self-evaluation system. We're not certifying your policies and procedures in place because that's your management system. That's how you follow the intent of the standard. The standard is build a set of communication tools that sit in place that people can follow and, and go for guidance. But there's this other part to the management system that this industry is absolutely guilty of murder by not focusing on the self-evaluation cycle. And I don't like using the industry terminology, but right now I'm going to throw in plan, do, check, out. We certify that the organisation plans, does, checks and acts, and it's that simple. We don't certify that you've met clause 3.2.1.4.A, you know, dot, 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 colon, specific clause, because I got toasted by Jazz Ends on that last week. I completely missed something way down buried where I needed to present to you on my website my performance factors that I promise. You been picked up on that yet? <laughs> It's the performance, you have to have, I have to tell you the objectives and targets and promises that I make to the marketplace. I've never, in 15 years, I've never come across that. And the auditor I had last week, so I've gone all the way down, yeah, because there's a comma here and there's a clause there and it says that word, you need to comply with this, show me. I was like, well, here's a video, does that deal with it? Well, actually, that does. She didn't like it, it was on video. It's sitting there, it's public, and it had 30,000 views on YouTube, so people have looked at it. She didn't like the fact that there was data of views because they're typically in, they're used to looking at the website and it's really hard to get the analytics of kids to the website but when you look at YouTube and it's a video of me saying this is what we're passionate about this is what we're committed to and it's got 30,000 views there's no debate and you know what it also had a couple hundred likes and no dislikes and so for her it was really challenging I could see as a you know, a, a mid 60s South African contract auditor for Jazzans, she was really challenged by the fact that the world has changed. So, the question I want to ask you is what would you observe is the average age of the middle level managers, supervisors, people in the organisation that we're building these systems for the audience? What's the average age of the audience that we're building the system for? And from a certification, perspective, I'm asking our guys to ask that question. What is the average age of your workforce? Because we are not building management systems today to deal with the audience. We're building management systems that we're comfortable to deal with. 
we're wearing clothes and styles and haircuts that we're comfortable with. We're not deploying empathy to our audience. We're not dealing with the 18 year old. We're not dealing with my eight year old. He's like, he's all over me with these devices. I thought I was good. And you, you can all tell the same story. I need you guys to think about that. That's what we need to do because this is about efficacy. It's about organizational behavior. It's about building things for our audience. And there is a saying that goes something like, uh, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a lovely gentleman writing a beautiful love story for uh, the love of his wife. And he's saying something to the worst of the effect of, I'm really, really sorry that I wrote you a really, really long love letter because I didn't have time to write you a short one. And we don't take the time to do the market research internally or in the organization. We just go, you know what, that's a template. Let's tweak it. That suits. And so what I really want you to be focused, I would prefer that we could have a deep dive discussion in an assessment around who is the audience that you're focusing on. We're not quite there yet, we're doing the research because that's planning before we do the doing and the checking and the acting because we're really focusing on the audience and the people in the organization. Let's build a management system on Snapchat. Let's have our management system sit in Instagram stories. Let's put PDFs inside a Facebook workbook. You know, all the internal training at best practice is run through a private secret Facebook group. So all of our team that are remote all of the time can sit on the couch at night and dial into the Facebook group and see what happened every day. You want the secret source for how best practice operates and maintains culture? It's a private secret Facebook group that I've pumped all this energy that I've got for you right now into that group. And Hugh might not see it for a couple of days because he's been really busy and then Alexi might be climbing a mountain over in Nepal. But eventually, Alexi will post a picture. Hey, I'm on holidays, I'm doing some six week, what does he take? 10, 12 weeks of leave without pay, just traveling? Mm -hmm. Six months? Yeah. Six months. But he's a team member and he's out following his dreams and his passion and he's sharing that energy back into the team. That's the secret source of best practice. And I want to encourage you to show that. So when someone says, can you show me the training register that everybody has done this particular role out of this communication, I show Jazans the seen by list of that post. Prove to me that they watched. Prove to me. Two people are dozing off already in this presentation. You, you can sign the attention to register. That evidence is, is exactly the same evidence as the same by in the Facebook group, right? So let's not have a fucking debate about the attendance register and a signature. They were logged into Facebook. The, the app says that they saw it. It's no different to the piece of paper that's got the initial. Make sense? So really, I really want you to challenge. I re and, 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 the, and the the soapbox, if you like, in terms of ISO 9001 now, is to really say risk-based thinking. Risk-based thinking is not just about you know the fact that you know let's put a bollard on the road out there so the car doesn't drive over the edge, and that's part of the quality system to keep the cars on the road. Risk is the risk of building a management system that's not effective in delivering objectives and targets for the organisation. ISO 9001. This is out of the. IAF, sorry, ISO, um, ISO PDF that goes with the, the launch of risk-based thinking and you can go Google it or I can share it with the group. But I, I try as much as possible to draw all of my guidance right back up with IAF and ISO. Like we're flooded in our office with IAF documents, thousands and thousands of guidelines, guidelines as a signature to the convention. But I want you guys to be you know, looking at that level and really challenging, okay, the committee, the committee are full of really, really intelligent and smart people and they write some really great stuff. You know, even the name for best practice came out of the first paragraph of ISO 9001, um, the previous edition of the standard. We were just like, well, what do we call this organization? Well, I just read this. I went looking for the standard for inspiration. I went, you know, international best practice. Okay, well, that'll do. Best practice. You know, international best practice guideline. Um, but ISO 9001 is, is, to, you know, is to establish a systematic approach to considering risk rather than treating prevention. And we spent a lot of time over the last 15, 20 years talking about preventative strategy corrective and preventative action and you get into these debates about well you know that's not corrective that's preventative and then 4801, 4801 came out in 2001 and it really set the scene for actually you know hang on a minute oh h &S, we're talking about prevention well why aren't we doing that over in quality so i was using all of my learning from doing oh &S at university to go hang on a minute actually let's just take a safety approach to this i, I went really deep on oh &S in my degree and then i start working in quality more more formally and i'm like hang on a minute let's just use that approach let's use the hierarchy of control in our quality system what's at the bottom of the hierarchy of control 
And what's just above that? And what is Tyner on paper? Administration. We're spending so much money putting Tyner on paper when we really got to think a level above that. And that's what risk-based thinking is about. It's about utilising those sorts of things in reverse engineering. So if I can really challenge you today, and I can say, well, okay, hang on a minute, let's go come up with our own version of the hierarchy of control and start really using that in terms of how do we actually deliver amazing outcomes for our customers. You know, because ISO 9001 really, all it's, all, all it's really about is delivering the promises we make to our customers or our stakeholders, whether we're a government department, not-for-profit, or whether we're a commercial entity. It's, it's building the system, the process and procedures, the repeatability around the objective, which is deliver our promise to the marketplace. Because without customers, without a marketplace, we don't have an organisation. Forget all the technical risk management systems we build, no customers, no one knows about you, then we can't do business with anybody. We can't, you know, we can't deliver that noble cause for the marketplace. So it, it's treating prevention as, a, you know, we, we, we want to get to this, get away from prevention as a separate component and we want to be fully really thinking about the consequences of our actions. And I'll quote my mum, she said, you know, all the way through my team, she's like, you really got to think more carefully about the consequences of your actions. <coughs> That's what this is all about. Like, we, and, and I guess, if we, you know, we get too complicated. We, we, we just really want to think really simply. So what I want to tell you about is we don't refer to ourselves as a CAB or a conformity assessment body, although I do hear it sometimes from our team. We refer to ourselves as a business improvement agency. And there's three parts to best practice. There's the body that we know as this conformity assessment body. There is a team of business coaches. And I'm focusing on education and coaching as a more impactful way to achieve the outcomes that I want, which is to inspire customer confidence. And we are choosing in a lot of instances to not take clients through the certification journey. In fact, I'm actively steering the leads we get away from certification into a discovery workshop that says, why do you want to get certified? <coughs> Tell me why. And I'll, and I'll cut that short for you. For the vast majority of our clients, if I do the seven whys exercise, that at number four or five, they will often break down into tears when I'm sitting with a business owner. I will say, why do you want to get certified? Because we want to tender the upcoming bitumen at the Williamstown Railways. Why do you want to do that? Why is, why is upgrading the bitumen project and tendering on that project really, really important to you? Well, it's a really great project and I can see that there could be some profit in that and, and actually working for the government would be really good because they pay their bills on time. So why is having your bills paid on time? Yeah. So why is having your bills paid on time really important? Because I can guarantee when you go to do that project, it's going to be really administratively burdensome for your very small business. Oh, well, you know, we, you know, we've got issues with cash flow and we're trying to like just survive and I want to keep all these people employed and I really love my team and their family and I feel responsible and I lose sleep every night to make sure that their salary is being paid and I've got this enormous tax bill and I've got a $350,000 loan with the tax office and I'm just trying to run my small business and I see that if I get certified and I just stretch myself just that little bit further, I can win that project and they'll pay their bill on time and, and, and life will be amazing and we'll go and do all this government work all around the country and we'll be a national company. Okay, great. So you said it was really important to pay your bills on time. You said your team is really important. Why is that? Well, actually, it's been really stressful for me the last 12 months because I haven't, I haven't been able to manage my cash flow. So then I'll say, well, why is managing cash flow really important? And I'll get stuck getting down in the whys. And invariably, you know, I want to feel like I'm doing meaningful work and I'm really tired and I'm really fatigued and I shouldn't have started the business in the first place. And I'm about to be the statistic that 70% of businesses fail in the first five years. So when a client comes to us to say, hey, hey, I want to get certified, I'm pushing that across and I'm saying, actually, you know what, no. I'm not going to let you apply for certification. And, and Mike was asking me a question and I didn't answer it on purpose. In the last 12 months, there's been a 12% decline in ISO, certifi ISO 9001 certifications globally. Because the industry is guilty of murder. The industry is guilty of not helping organisations and showing the chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers, who is in advising most of the top end of town here in this, in, in this country, that there's no value in this. He's not an advocate for this industry. And so it is our job to really be thinking about meaningful why work. And if we want, if I want to continue to be a certifier, I need to show that certification adds value to the marketplace. And I am struggling to do that. I'm trying very hard, and some of you can see me try very hard to do that. I work night and day tirelessly, making a lot of noise on social media, doing things like this. But still, I, all I'm doing is I'm using a defibrillator to try and keep the industry alive. 
But the reality of the numbers is that this industry is in decline and people don't value 9001 like they did. It's become a minimum procurement requirement. It is our job, it is your duty, it is your ethical obligation to come with me on this journey. And so what I think we need to be doing in terms of the solution, we need to be looking more carefully at the problem. And the problem, I think, to just cut this, the long story very, very short, is that companies and organisations all want to be successful. We all want to be successful. We have a dream and that goal might be just to spend time with the grandkids, it might be to be able to pick up the kids from school on time, it might be to be able to go on a holiday, it might be able to gather family and have, you know, the, the other parts of life that are the, the two thirds of the other third. There's the third at work and there's the two third, you know, a third sleeping and a third doing social stuff. And then there's the weekends. We want to be really thinking about that. So successful companies intuitively, not necessarily using 9001, and they intuitively incorporate risk-based thinking to improve governance, to establish a proactive culture of improvement, to assist with, assist with statutory and regulatory, regulatory compliance, to assure consistency of quality of products and services, to improve customer confidence and satisfaction. So, I, so that is the challenge. That, that is where I want you guys to be really thinking about what is the problem we are solving. If you want, I'll share this presentation with everybody so you can, you can circulate it within your group. That's the thing to take a photo of with your phone right now, if you want to, and, and, and take the note. That's the problem that we're solving. We, you know, and you can dig down and it's gonna be different words in different organizations, but it's the organization wants to improve their governance. They want to establish a proactive culture of improvement. They want to assist with managing statutory and regulatory compliance. They want to assure consistency of quality products and services, and they want to improve customer confidence and satisfaction. You know, and there's safety and there's environment, and you know, that we want the organisation to get a fun place to work and a great place to invest in and a great place to buy from. There's, you know, that's all part of this journey, but we really, really want to be thinking about what the problem is that we're solving. And we can start to say, okay, well, we'll be thinking about the next 12 weeks, and we can talk about quarterly, I would, I would like to leave you with my opinion, and I've got lots of opinions, but this particular opinion is that management review should be quarterly. In fact, it must be quarterly. Because if you do management review quarterly, it ties up with what the account's thinking, which is this business needs to be reviewed quarterly. If we go annually, don't worry, it's okay. It's only gonna be an hour and it's only gonna be once a year. Forget that. Try it four times in a year and get three of them wrong and get one of them right instead of once a year and getting one wrong. It's gonna take you four years to get to the same point. It's like going to the gym every day. It's like doing exercise every day. It's like eating every day. It's like breathing every day. The more often and smaller we do this, the more we practice, the better we're going to get. And so as, as the head of certification, if you like, although I don't sign off on certification decisions with best practice, I am encouraging people to do more, more things more frequently. Quantity over quality. Absolutely quantity over quality. A huge amount of quantity over quality. Because you know what happens when you do a huge quantity, it brings quality. Quantity brings quality. Don't be led into the disbelieving, you know, the, the disbelief of a whole community that says, no, no, we've got to focus on quality. That is absolute bullshit. You do it more often, you will get quality. Quality comes with practice. Quality doesn't come because we sit and analyze and we got paralyzed over what we need to do. Quality comes with execution. Quality comes with doing it more often. So I, I, I want to encourage the people that get audited and then the people that audit, I want to encourage you not to be scared of making mistakes. And, and the, the number of times that I've had to simmer down arguments of, over people getting potentially fired because of you know, reports with non-conformances, I'm like, well, fuck, get rid of the non-conformances. Let's just write a report that's got 50 observations. I don't give a shit about that process. I really don't care about the jazz ends accreditation. I care about the impact on the beautiful people that work in the organisations. And I will be the person that will sit between, you know, if it needs to be jazz ends and the organisation, and that is why I'm actively steering best practice away from certification. Yes, we'll continue to operate in the marketplace. Yes, people will keep coming to us to get certified. Yes, I'll keep growing that business, but I have that conversation up front because it's about the impact that we want to have. Does 9001 and certification solve the problem? If we get really, really clear on the problem and that's the thing that's gonna solve the problem, yes. It would be ethical of me to recommend it, but I will not continue to campaign. It is the only solution to the problem. And I want you guys to think the same way. Get, 
the bedside manner of this industry, the only thing that's going to present, prevent us from murdering more organisations is to actually spend time getting really clear on the problems that the organisation has and then thinking about how we can solve those problems. And that applies everywhere. Okay. So, focusing on outcomes. We really want to focus, what are the outcomes? What are the things that we want to achieve? The monitoring measurement, the sections 8 and 9 and 10 of ISO 9001 at the back end. Have a real think about that. What are the outcomes that we want to achieve? Um, I just want to quickly mention this and then I'll open it up for questions. In February next year, we're going to take this discussion into Sydney and it's open up for everybody. It's a time to bring everybody in to have these discussions about things like what are the 10 things that successful organisations need to do? What do they need to do? What If we rip away the standards and we don't have ISO, what does a business best practice model look like? And I just want to make you guys aware, it might not be something that you're into, but we're going to run a two-day conference down in Sydney next year in February, where we're going to bring people in, and I'm bringing in CEOs, and I'm bringing in business leaders, and I'm going to try and jag the, the chairman of the board from PwC. I'm bringing those guys in to have the conversation about what are the things that we need to do to help organisations to grow and improve. And that may see us all going in a different direction. I don't, you know, and I won't go, I'll, I'll, I'll stop ranting about stuff, but, I, but we get caught up in this concept of sunk cost. And even, you know, all the effort that I've put into building best practice and, or, and that we've put into building the industry, maybe it's time to really think about, A, do we push 9001 to get even better? Because I think it's a pretty good standard. Don't get me wrong, I love it. Do we push it even harder? But if we start having the conversation here in Australia, remembering that 4801 was the best standard that's ever been written and it was, it was published in 2001 around risk-based thinking, around actually a management system that starts to work. Yes, it's got its issues. And you know why it's got its issues? Because it was designed by a committee. But if we can get industry consensus, that starts to become a generic term around these are the things that become the 10 things that organisations should be doing. The person that is sitting on Saturday night thinking that they're going to start a business and then spends all day next Sunday building a website and then going to market, they are likely to be a statistic of a failure. I would like to have more of a generic conversation exist here in this country where people know and you guys can inform that barbecue dinner conversation around, okay, if that's the thing that you want to do to run your business, will you be happy if it doesn't work in the first four years and it doesn't fail, but it doesn't blow up and become Facebook? Because everybody thinking about starting a business is like, it's gonna be like Facebook, it's gonna be like Uber, it's gonna be like Airbnb, it's gonna be amazing and I'm gonna be Zuckerberg and I'm gonna be able to wear a t-shirt and white sneakers to work. Okay, that's great. Are you passionate enough about it to wait 20 years for it to blow up? because that's typically how long it takes. It takes 20 years for these things to happen. Would you be happy doing it for 20 years? And the first thing that should be in the standard is are we happy to do that process for the next 20 years because that's how long it's going to take to get it to work. Does that make sense? Is everyone with me? Okay, so um, that's my little rant. That's it for if my laptop will wake up. That's it, that's it, that's the end. Um, any questions, any thoughts? Go. The uh, Jazz Ains sent out a Delphi study to a lot of people and it was to a range of stakeholders to give some input about the future of Ordinance competencies. Did you get involved in that? Um, we were asked to complete the survey yeah. and we put a fairly significant response together around bedside manner and soft skills. Yeah, well, what came out was basically the Delphi study said that it's just one thing to be able to write a report and all this type of thing and know the standard. Um, the consolidated view was exactly what Jamie was saying. It was about the soft skills, understanding the leadership, understanding the business, understanding going into an organisation and just being a nice person and just gradually kind of understanding the business processes. And that's not what all auditors are. <laughs> and that's, uh, as Katie was saying, so it was uh, interesting you say that because that's, that's basically what was found. I mean, it's, I'm just watching, like, and 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 I guess um, you know, we we campaign a term which we, we try really hard not to use the word audit or auditor, because the minute that you say it, it just it's an instant anxiety. Mm. Like, it's not an attractive 
job title for a barbecue on a Saturday night? Like, so, you know, does it inspire improvement in the organisation? Does it does it elicit that, you know, that let's get things to work towards objectives? Most people just get scared and anxious. So that is, this is what I'm talking about. Let's, okay, let's murder the conversation on Saturday night. What do you do for your job? I'm an auditor. You know, tax or quality assurance, you know? So, so we, we, that's really our challenge. Like, I want you to leave the room today. Like, come up with some creative, like I'm a change agent or I'm a coach. Like, and then this is why we're saying business coach. Like, you guys are all coaches. And I want you to really think about, like, n nobody likes a finger pointed at them. You know what you should do? And, and there's a LinkedIn article from way back that, that I wrote that went viral, which is why I banned the word should. What we might consider. But the coaches ask questions. The solution lies, the solution to a problem lies in the mind that has that problem. And how do we put problems in people's minds that we solve? We put them there with question marks. So are you more influential ending your sentences with a full stop or a question mark? Of course, a question mark. And so it's the questioning techniques and the leading of the witness mm. to the solution that has the better outcome. The questioning technique came up a lot in that job lesson. Absolutely. Like I don't know if they're listening, but... <laughs> it's, look, th there's this whole concept of ethics, right? It's, it's unethical for this industry to continue to operate on a pick and a flick exercise. There's your bit of paper, all right, go off. Because people don't care. And, 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 and we also have to say, you know what? If you don't value what I'm doing, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go and, you know, I'm going to go and sit on the beach because I'll value my time sitting on the beach. And that is what's happening in this industry is we're thinking we're going just through this routine and we're saying, you know, tick, flick, tick, flick, there's your bit of paper, off you go. And, and look, I get the commercial pressures every single day when I'm trying to like actually you know we've got to accept this deal because you know well, let's just put it in at a cheaper price, all that crazy stuff. You know that's what happens at the commercial end. You know we're a commercial entity at the end of the day. I've got 50 people that I've got to pay their payroll. You know every second month. And so I get caught up in it, but it's a constant challenge, and it, and it really challenges my ethics. And that's why I'm pushing so hard. That's why this presentation is not let's talk about the clauses of the standard. I'm going to bring in risk-based thinking. I think it's excellent. It's a step in the right direction. But maybe we just found a rock in the middle of a flooded river that we could stand on. We're still going to get swept away. So I really want you guys to think about that. Think about with the way that we're going to really get some momentum is to really, and really drive change is to really think about the problem we're solving and the most effective way for the average age group, the 25 to 35 year olds. Go and ask that question. When you're working with an organization, just out of interest, just say, what's the average age of the people that work here? Because I guarantee you, they saw the boom bust of Snapchat. And they live life in Instagram but, stories. Toby, how do you know we're not already doing that? You, your conversation is assuming that we're not already working with the, the age that the people are. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I 100% so agree. How, with where you. do you get that from? Because the, my business is. Perfect. That's excellent. But, but across 1,200 companies, the data in my organisation says that 80%. Okay. The, 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 the statistics are there. Okay. Um, my question was, um, I've heard everything you've said, and yes. I agree completely with the soft skills. Yeah. But we, we, most of us are working either in or with organisations that have certification or are seeking certification, while I say no, but whatever. Mm -hmm. So my concrete question is, have you as a certifying body seen an improvement in business success with the implementation and introduction of the 2015 no. version. Is there any movement in the businesses that you certify because of 2015? Uh, Absolutely not. 2015. It's had no impact. Whatsoever. Really? That's absolutely. what I wanted to know coming here today. Yeah, absolutely not. It's made no difference. I tell you what it's done is it's enabled our conversation. It's enabled, it's enabled a better quality conversation and absolutely no, because all that happened was those organisations that want the bit of paper for the foyer and the tenders mm -hmm. just created a customer risk register as a tab on their safety no, risk register. they didn't all do that. 1,200 companies, 30% of them who just want the bit of paper just did the minimum requirement. And my team are guilty of letting them do that. That's the only change that took place in 30% of our clients. Yeah. give, this is just my opinion and, and, and the data that I asked our team to come back to our office with. The question was, did ISO 9001 2015 and 
and exchange to risk-based thinking, cause improvements and success for the organisations? Oh my, my answer to the question from my observation, I wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to. It's I genuinely do. Three years old. I mean, talk about twenty yeah. years. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I think about. Oh, yeah. I, I genuinely cannot say I haven't got the data. I haven't got the feedback. We're not getting it back from our net promoter score that says that things change the standard is causing the businesses. No, I agree. Successful. I mean, we, we've seen some change. We've been. I, don't we've get been me wrong. Tangible. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, like I, I want to make. About that. Let me just be yeah. clear yeah. about the link in terms of success. Has there been a change? Yes. But the change is not because of the standard, the change is because it's an enabled conversation around. Oh. Yeah. Well, yes, but um, without yeah. the standard changing, that conversation would never go. I tell you what has happened. The question around success, no. Around more efficient process, yes. Because it took the people that do have the ear of senior leadership in the organisations, and I'm going to say it's about 25%. As a guide, about a quarter of our clients have engaged top management, about a quarter. It enabled a conversation to take place, what are some customer risks that we might have? And so if you hear my constant campaign about in thinking about the next 12 weeks, what does success look like? In thinking about the next 12 weeks, what could go wrong? In thinking about the last 12 weeks, what went wrong? You know, the management review questions we should be asking. It enabled a conversation to take place. Are those companies more profitable as a result of 2015? No. Exactly right. And I'm, I'm not going to give the standard the credit. I'm not going to stand here as an authority on this oh, subject. No, it's certainly not. You know, yeah. until such time as there is data. And I am trying to measure it. I think it's the questions asked. I think that's an important point you said before. And I think there have been professionals for 40 years who have done that, who are, who are worthy, worse than they ever. Mm -hmm. But I've seen them work with them. Mm -hmm. And I've thankfully, I've been able to do it myself too. So Absolutely. Um, I think that professional approach is something that, that's timely. It might be getting Absolutely. better. As an organisation, we're in a, we're in our own bubble, and we might meet in this group and talk amongst ourselves and say, since ISO uh, 9001 changed in 2015, we've had all these gains and wins, etc. Mm -hmm. But you guys, the the external auditors to us, see the differences that it's mm -hmm. making in business, it's, it's and that's what I'm interested to know about. The business on the basis of its context, on the basis of its leadership, representation, all those things, which I agree. I and, agree. And it's a, like I do like the point about questioning rather than directing. I'm directing this problem because because that's actually that's actually unethical. Not even forget that. Yeah. To, to direct somebody, it's their own business. That's right. Let them let that's them right. answer the question. Yeah, I think right. that's really important. Yeah. 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 Um, games have been sorry. Games have been with people coming in to quality mm. after 2015, um, where it's the first time they're building. Uh, because they're starting with 2015, mm -hmm. they're getting, I think, better outcomes than the people that we've now tried to drag yeah. across a transition yeah. period. It's been through and we as an industry definitely haven't done a good enough job at taking them on the improvement team. I'm going to say that. The, the thing I was going to say was I'm not an auditor, but just bear with me, but I do know something about the IAF in 2011. So the JASANS requirement for all auditors well, I agree with it, but basically they have to audit the client's processes, the end-to-end -end processes. What you just said about understanding of the questions in ISO 9001 and all management system standards for context leadership and planning and all the clauses, sorry to say this, you are not to ask that question. You have to get the client's processes, as Kate was saying about the outcome, you have to look at the processes to deliver the outputs, to deliver the outcome. Mm. The power of the so-called audit is to know the standard. What you're supposed to see and what's presented to you is that if you're not responsible to the client mm. over excellent, you have to present to the auditor the processes and it's up to the auditor to just see as to whether any of the requirements are actually embedded in those kind of processes. Yes. Oh. I, mean, I know yes. this sounds very basic to all of us. No, you're quite right. But I've, I've, as I said, the KB, I've just had a defence supplier sent some into another company that they want us to go and help them. And they just got certified by a, a European certification body and they just copied the clauses in the ISO 9001. Now they want to do 27,000, 45,000, 14,000. And I said to the person, 
and you go into the conversation. She said, oh, the system's very good. I said, why is it good? She said, oh, they got certified. I said, what can you say? I said, does, does any business benefit? Yeah, I, I Nothing. Think, I think everyone in this room agrees that just a, a replica of the contents of the page is, is a waste of time. Mm. Um, they still get ordered it. They still get passed. Yeah. And that's the, the integrated use of management system do. standards. We did a survey all around the world, and the only ones that were in that handbook for ISO are all process based. Mm -hmm. Some are on one page. Mm -hmm. And, oh, it's, and it's been quite refreshing. And I take Katie's point, it, it gets very disturbing when you don't see leadership and that. And you see some of these European ones, and they really get it. They, mm -hmm. oh, they power on. You think, wow, I wish we had that in Australia. I, I mean, I go to Asia a lot and around the world for ISO and standards. You go to Singapore or Oh, Lumba, and they've got 1,200 people there for the Quality Circle Conference, and they're, they're, they're giving prizes of most supportive leadership and management. I'm, I'm sitting there crying my eyes out. I'm going, why are you crying? I mean, we don't do this in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen. Yeah. I, I want to ask you guys a question um, around uh, strategically, and I think a lot about you know, 4 or 5, 10, 15, 20 years ahead. Um, and I think I've got the energy to put 20 more years in, in terms of my passion and my motivation. But the observation that I'm currently making is around the 15-year-old person that is currently sitting in the middle of high school and, the, and their life in terms of influence. And I, and, and you know, whether my views distort or whether I'm, I'm a bit delusional, at the end of the day, unfortunately, ISO 9001 has become a program for the vast majority of our clients it's driven the industry is ultimately driven by procurement policy and so we want to be very mindful of the change that's going to occur in procurement policy so this group 15 years ago would have been a meeting of 100 and in fact I presented to 100 people in Newcastle 15 years ago to a group like this and now the group's the so we, we really want to start to look and make some observations of what's happening, particularly around procurement. And, and I will take you right now into your own lives and your time off when you take holidays. And you take holidays, maybe you'll go internationally, maybe you'll go to another city in Australia, and you're looking for someone, somewhere to go out, you're looking for a hotel to go check out, um, maybe you're, you're looking for something to do, and when we're making our own personal procurement decisions, we're, ju we're jumping online and we're doing a search. If we're younger, so we're maybe 16, 17, 18, to do our due diligence as a 16, 17, 18 year old, we're gonna to go to Instagram, maybe TikTok, maybe not even a web browser, to do our due diligence on the person that we're gonna buy from, potentially. We're gonna follow the person that's got the most followers on, on social media. And, and I'm talking, and, and, and what I want you to be mindful of is what we build now has long reaching implications for the next 10 or 15 years. We really gotta be mindful of that. What's the active life of the work that we do? Is it three, is it 12, is it 24, is it 36? Is it, I really want you to be thinking about this. Now, if I'm right in saying that we work in a procurement system, broadly speaking, the financial driver for this industry is that there are organisations who seek certification because it's driven by procurement policy, for example. There are definitely organisations out there that come to us for the improvement benefits of 9001, but I'll give you an example of a solar, power, solar panel project management company in Monovale in Sydney, who has what I would have thought was a pretty good quality management system in place, certified to the three standards, has just hired a $200,000 a year lean manager to put lean through all of their projects. And I'm sitting there going, what the fuck just happened? So I'm gutted that my team member has not been able to, and myself, because the guy lives five minutes from me and I see him at social events, we have not been able to actively get our message across that you've got the management system, improve your organization and have efficiency. But now you're going to add 200 grand under the line in the middle of your P&L and overheads for a lean person because you don't even know that you can use this system to improve your organisation. And he's one of our good clients. So back to this question about procurement. When you go on holidays, you'll go and you'll do a quick search, where should I go out for dinner? You know, I was, 
And, and what prompted me to do this was I was sitting with a, uh, a friend of mine that I worked with in a, um, in a beautiful noodle restaurant in the middle of Sydney, having a catch up dinner. And we're like, let's go somewhere else for dessert. Quick Google search. What comes up when you do that Google search? Looking for somewhere to go out and have dinner or have a meal. What's the first hits that you get in your web browser? It's, it's an organization. Who is it? TripAdvisor. So I want you guys to watch very carefully what is happening in your procurement decisions personally because while we may work in the industry, actually purchasing ourselves, if we hold ourselves accountable, we don't seek out ISO certified companies to make our own purchasing decisions. Well, ISO 9001 is all our procurement officers to be lazy and just look for the 9001 symbol. At the moment. Okay, we'll at the have moment. Them. We'll, at the moment. We'll have them. At the moment. At yeah, the moment. In part. Yeah. But if we talk about this concept of average age and that and the average that, age of that, that person. Won't continue. No. Because the 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old in 10 years' time is going to be 30, and the 22 year old, 25 year old is going to be 35. They've been making procurement decisions based on transparent, mm -hmm. internet based, social media based review of their supplier who's going to feed them that night or who they're going to buy clothes from. It depends how much trust they have in that system. Well, trust, I guarantee you for a 25 year old comes with hundreds of thousands of followers not one auditor in a brown cardigan no, no, going and doing an ISO certification of course, of course, so we they can still make a mistake procuring in that fashion 100 percent, i agree with you but what we're talking about is the survival of this industry oh. as a solution to a problem this industry i'm challenging does it actually elicit trust you know, our tagline of best practices inspire customer confidence because I'm like, that's what we're about. We're meant to be working with a customer so their customer feels more confident to purchase from them. That's why it's inspire customer confidence. I've thought about this, but I am dead set worried right now and I'm pivoting our organization for this. So do you want your marketplace to see ISO certification or do you want your marketplace to see a 4.95 rate out of five star rating on TripAdvisor. You make the decision because I'm gonna help you with a management system to get to you to that point. I have to, for the benefit of my family and my wife, like I'm, I'm like the sunk cost is gone. Like I'm not gonna go right, I'm gonna flog this thing right to the very end and I need you guys to be thinking that way too. You can choose not to, okay, but I want you to be watching procurement decision well, and the eliciting of trust in the market. We should be asking Mike whether ISO has that in mind. I realise you've got to go. I was this case, if I may. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I sit here, I'm on the QR 008 committee for Standard Australia. I don't know if you know that. I represent the Australian Industry Group and all the members. So it's not, it's not my view. So when I sit on sure. that, I went to a nominating meeting on, on Tuesday with Standard Australia. I'm also on the, uh, I represent the Institute of Management Consultants. I'm a, a certified management consultant. Uh, I pass all the exams. That doesn't mean much. Yeah. So blah, blah, blah. So the reason I'm saying all that background. ISO has got a meeting in Barbados on the uh, 3rd of November. Gee, that would be tough. Oh, it's a tough job. Come <laughs> around a little bit. You know, like 28 degrees air temperature, 28 degrees water temperature. My God, it's going to be a struggle. Martinis would be hopefully 12 degrees. Zero. Anyway, the reason I'm saying that is that um, the meeting is quite big. Everything that Katie has said, we, we are very well aware of it. I actually okay. am an Australian, I am an expert with ISO. So besides standard, I have to re represent Australia and all of you. Mm -hmm. So that's why I come as much as I can to these meetings, because I need to get what you're saying mm -hmm. back to ISO. Mm -hmm. So I was in Vienna uh, six weeks ago mm -hmm. at the high level structure review, which then moved, you probably heard, it went from Annex SL to Annex L. Mm -hmm. Not that it matters to you. But the high level structure is actually, when you read the what they call the requirements, the High level structure is for ISO, working committees, federal committees, task forces, members to write management system standards. It's for nobody else. You are not to use it. It's only for us to write, which I did, 9001, 45001, and other ones that I've been involved with. You are not to touch it. If you touch it, it's actually a copyright. Actually, it's a pattern. <laughs> So that's why they even say in ISO 9001, 2015, which we didn't do, and Toby's right on this, we didn't communicate this very well, 
Alan Daniels, who's the head of Boeing, uh, is the communication guy for ISO, and he wrote, he's got a big column on communication, I, and I take Toby's point back to ISO. <laughs> First part of ISO 9000 says, it is not the intent of this international standard for you to document your management system by the clauses of this standard. Mm. When we got to 45001, we realised we stuffed up, so we really, really tried hard to take what Toby was saying about 4801 and OHS, OHS 18001, yeah. but we really strengthened all the processes. So we said we wanted to do 5.1C, I think it was, um, it, top management, which is your thing about leadership, and I love your comment about the Six Sigma 200,000 person, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. Top management has to ensure the integration of XXX, in that case OH and S, mm -hmm. requirements into the business processes. So what we did in 45,001, we repeated it in six, we repeated it in seven, we repeated it in eight, mm -hmm. and as Katie was saying about eight, nine, and 10, we really pounded the hell out of it. Now, are people doing it? No. Are they getting benefit out of their migration? No, as I was saying, that they've been going and copying the clauses of the new standard and updating their 4801. And then they get certified. They're not supposed to do yeah, that. I'll make, I'll make two final remarks so, so on from my perspective, and then I'll stop talking. The first is on the transitions. Jazz hands give us a day. No, no. You know, no, they don't give us a day. We wrote a plan and said we're going to do transitions in a day. Really? You know, if you want to have an impactful transfer, that's right. Because the market won't tolerate ten thousand dollars to do a transfer. They'll tolerate you know eighteen hundred, twenty five hundred. My last question I want you to think about. What happens if TripAdvisor releases Business Advisor star rating scheme? Oh. Okay. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Just one I've got, because I've got like, one for the kids. Yeah, you, you need to know this. I just want to open it up here yeah. now. So. Ask me a question if you like, but on, um, on in Barbados, we're going to discuss uh, risk based thinking. So that's coming up um, in uh, Barbados. We've got the financial benefits of ISO 